Meditation is not an exercise, but for me, it's some sort of philosophy. It's a way that you behave and through which you approach the world. It's not about a thing that you do, like you go running and then that's it. No, you really, you live differently, you behave differently, you interact differently with people. And I think that if we all have that awareness and would portray that philosophy, the world would be a better place and we would all behave much nicer towards each other. Even though there are these wonderful apps out there, some people who are not connected to their nervous system anymore, where the mind-body connection is a bit lost. Let's say for people who have been hyperventilating or suffering from hyperventilation or having a lot of panic attacks, they're just so disconnected from their body as well. And then it can be hard to just read a book or follow a course or something. So I believe that these physical tools where you literally don't have to think or follow or do anything anymore, you just hold on and you breathe with it, can be very useful as well. This episode of the Kintsugi Podcast is brought to you by Pause, Breathe, Reflect, which can help you bring mindfulness to your everyday moments. Hey there, my fellow like-hearted humans. It's Michael, and this is the Kintsuki Podcast. I love this week's conversation of connection. It's with someone who reached out to me via Instagram, proving that it is possible in today's age to form connection and start a friendship through social media. She's someone who is dealing with her own challenge and came up with a solution. She's creative, she's curious, she's an innovator, she's a founder, she's a partner, a daughter, and a sister. And along with her brother, they created Moonbird, which is a handheld device to help someone sleep better and ease anxiety. And we talk more about it in our conversation. And what I love about our conversation is that we actually had a conversation. We went back and forth. So often on podcasts, the host will pepper the guest with a bunch of questions. But what I loved about Stephanie is that she was willing to go back and forth. It was really cool. And I hope you enjoy our format and our conversation. So if you're ready, take a healthy breath in and a slow releasing breath out and get to know Stephanie Burroughs and her story of Moonbird. Hey, Stephanie. Great to see you. Hi, Michael. Likewise. Thanks for inviting me, first of all. I think this is going to be a great conversation. So for everyone listening, Stephanie and I are going to go back and forth. So it's not going to be like a typical podcast where there are 10 questions that I'm going to fire at Stephanie. We're going to go back and forth and we're going to talk about connection and healing and our breath and a whole bunch of other things. So One question, though, I do love to ask as we start, how is your central nervous system feeling right now? I'm actually a bit nervous. I'm super excited about this, but I also feel it in my nervous system. Yeah. And I always find that remarkable that I'm I'm in this journey as well of doing the startup and the entrepreneur life for four or five years still. And I'm super aware of my nervous system and how I can play around with it. And still, I find myself sometimes, I wouldn't say struggling, but noticing how it can change. And maybe it's because I have a lot of awareness around that, that I'm super conscious about it. But I find that super fascinating. So I'm positively excited about this and so ready to share my journey with Moonbird and to learn more about your journey as well. Oh, that's really cool. I can so appreciate like that feeling that is with you right now. Yesterday, I was talking to one of my executive coaching clients because besides doing my meditation teaching, I also coach executive leaders. And I could feel things change in my nervous system because I was about to ask him a really tough question. And so what I found myself doing this awareness, so he's answering a previous question. And it's leading to this really difficult question that 
it's sort of a breakthrough question. And I could feel things happening in my body. And, you know, I was like, okay, just breathe, you know, slow it down and ask the question. And, but I could totally feel it. There was a little trepidation. There was some excitement because I knew it could be a really powerful breakthrough question. So I totally feel you, Stephanie. I know that feeling, but I'm super psyched that you're here and we're going to have this like really awesome conversation. Thank you. And absolutely, I couldn't agree more. I find that, as I said, so fascinating. Within my journey of Moomert, when I started, I thought I knew a lot about the breath already, hence is why I felt confident enough in starting this journey. But then going through this journey of starting a company and building a team and also having lots of difficult moments, I feel that I myself has been challenged in so many different ways than I thought I could be challenged. And I discovered so many new things about my nervous system, my breath, and how I respond to certain situations. And exactly what you just mentioned is something that I, I find just super fascinating of myself as well, that in some board meetings or some important discussions, I suddenly feel like, whoa, my nervous system is firing inside of me and it's telling me these things. Yeah, I just think that's so cool. Yeah, the body is really, well, we'll get into it. The body's incredible. And to your point, like the journey, that, which we will also get into, we learn so much sometimes from our really difficult moments or so much learning. And then every now and again, I'm sure you feel this way. I know I have felt this way. Sometimes it's like, okay, I'm done with all the learning. I just want it to be easy. <laughs> like, I don't want another learning moment. I just want an, I want an easy moment. So let's do this for people who don't know you. Yes. We're going to take your profession and we're going to put Moonbird off to the side. How would you describe yourself if you didn't use your job as a way to describe yourself? Hmm. Good question. I would say that I am a person who loves to develop myself. I'm a person who's always enrolled in a course or another thing like that. I juggle a lot of different things at the same time and I can't really pick what I want to focus on. So I have like different projects, different things going on, hosting a party. I think I'm a quite diversely developed person, which is a nice thing because I, I'm super curious about stuff, but sometimes it also limits me a little bit in Sometimes it's just good to focus and pick one thing and, and just do that. I have a lot of interests and uh, curiosities, yeah. Yeah, I imagine there are days where you wish you had like a 25th hour. Oh, I wish every day that I had an extra day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel that. It's a blessing and a curse to be curious, right? There's so much to learn and discover and there's so many things that you get to do. Yeah, you know, we got to be really you know, precious and be smart about how we want to use our time. Yeah. Are you aware of the Mayor's Briggs personality test? Yeah, I know it. I know it fairly well. Before I started Moonbird and I, I was looking for my purpose, my ikigai in life, I was trying to find out like, what do I really want to do with my life? What do I like? Because I did my uni and then a PhD and then I did an extra master's and then I worked at two other startup companies before and I was just a bit lost like, oh, am I going to change job every year or what's my focus? What do I want to do? And then somebody advised me to take a lot of personality tests and this was one that I did and my result was that I'm an ENF. FP, a campaigner. And I read the description of that personality type, which mentioned something like, oh, you want to be a helicopter pilot. You want to be a professional cook. You want to learn Italian, Spanish, and Chinese whilst being a lawyer and having your own startup company all at the same time. And that's challenging, but it's also the beauty about your personality, something like that. I don't remember the exact words, but seeing that it was a specific personality type, that resonated so much with me because it finally felt that that's the thing. It is okay to be a person that has so many diverse interests. And for me, that was really, yeah, it was a revelation of seeing that and knowing that and embracing that as well. That's very cool. We don't have time for it today, but we could probably get into astrology, which is like like probably the first type of Myers-Briggs personality test. Like my youngest daughter is so into astrology and we had like a really thoughtful conversation about personality as it relates to our signs. And I'm like, that was like the Myers-Briggs before Myers-Briggs or the Hogan or the whole set of other personality tests. But from an extroverted, introverted perspective, I'm in the middle. I'm a what they call an amnivert. 
So I fuel up in big crowds. Like I love like one of the things I missed most during the pandemic was live music. I just love the, there's a term for it, collective effervescence, you know, like with a big show, you know, like everyone knows every word. And I also need my alone time on my bike. So I need a little bit of both. Yeah. Oh my God. I couldn't agree more. And I didn't even know that it had a term, what you just described. I love concerts as well. And we have a very famous rock festival every year in the town where I come from. And it's quite big. It's like 100,000 people come to it in a day. And there's just this thing when a big band starts to play a song and everybody knows the words. I get chills up and down my spine. And it does something to me, it like awakens me. And at that moment, each time I say, this is the best feeling in the world. Exactly what you just described. That's exactly the feeling that I have then. What's really cool about that is like, as you were talking about that feeling you have, like I started getting goosebumps here. Like my skin right now is a little tingly because I so appreciate that. Like that moment where you have the audience that knows the band really well and The band's playing their instruments, but the lead vocalist isn't singing, but the whole crowd is. It's like, whoa, like that is like, if you need a lesson in the fact that energy matters and we're all energy, for me, that's the one thing you can point to is like, everything is energy, including us. And we get to show up with the type of energy we want. And that puts a ripple effect into the world. And, and you know, go to any concert and you're going to feel that. So yeah, I love that we have that in common. I didn't know that. So that's really cool. So awesome. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Let's get into how did we get here? You're in Belgium. I'm in America. Can you share your perspective? Of like one, I would love for you to share how you sort of got to where you are with the start of Moonbird. But maybe you can add on to like, how did we find each other in the sea of humanity? How did these two humans connect? Yeah, I'm super thankful for that. And I, I'd love to share that. So taking a step back is why I started Moonbird. After I did my PhD, worked at two other startup companies, I was looking for my Ikigai and I developed some sleeping problems during my PhD, which I wanted to combat with breath work. I was already applying meditation techniques just for my general mental health, but then discovered the breath as a tool and how it's very different as well from meditative techniques and how it's very effective in down-regulating the nervous system within a few minutes. So I wanted to apply that for my own insomnia. And in doing that, I struggled to do it. Even though that I read the books, I took some courses, I felt that when you're so, so stressed and you're so entangled and busy in your mind, it's just very, very hard to keep your focus. And I know that's the essence of the whole meditation thing. But still, if you're having a panic attack, it's just very difficult to focus. So I wanted to help or develop a device that helps people to keep their focus. And for me, it was super intuitive that it should be something physical something that you hold and that guides you through motion. So something that expands and contracts like you're doing when you're breathing. And so that's a bit the genesis and the idea of Moonbird. It's a physical object that expands and contracts in the palm of your hand and that guides you to breathe at a certain rhythm. So it's different from an app in the sense that you have this physical shape. Not to say that I don't love apps. I love apps, but I just think that this is a complement to those things that are out there and can be used for different purposes or at different moments. Anyway, so we're a Belgian company and we, we developed that product for a couple of years. We put it on the market. And now that we've gotten the first feedback from our customers and we're a bit confident in the fact that it's a good product, it's working, we're selling it in Europe, we are scaling internationally. And so in that, search of how should we do that, I'm always looking for like-minded people. And so I'm scanning Instagram accounts, websites, people having podcasts and so on. And I bumped into your Instagram account and I just love what you're doing. And I was mesmerized by the community that you build and all the hard work that you've done on your own. And so I was already following you for a while. And then at some point I just said, I'm going to write you an Instagram message and see if we can connect and um, yeah, share our stories and potentially see if we can do something together. I know. I loved it. Like, so for everyone listening, like reach out to Stephanie, reach out to me, but reach out to people or accounts that you, you like that speak to you in some ways. You may get a response back. You may not, but if you don't at least try to reach out, the answer is always going to be no. 
So I was like, yeah, when the message popped up, I was like, all right, let me check this out. And so I love what you all are doing because I do think it's a compliment. I think, you know, meditation apps, like obviously I have one, um, it can be really powerful and there can be something quite soothing about voice, but there's also a need like your device and your approach is also one scientifically rigorous, right? There's great data behind it. So I do think, hey, as we go about trying to have better health, whether we're dealing with anxiety or dealing with sleep challenges or anything else, why not have as many tools in our toolbox? Or as I like to say, I sort of look at it as like, what tools do you have on your Swiss army knife? Because I don't think really anyone walks around with a toolbox. It's just way too heavy. So I like to think like, what do you have in your back pocket? And your breath, whether it's a breathwork exercise or pattern, Moonbird or an app like Pause, Breathe, Reflect, they all can really work together to help promote better health and well-being. And when we're there, then we're going to put, as I've mentioned earlier, a better ripple into the world. Yeah. And it's not about exclusively doing one thing or another. So I give workshops around this as well. And then I ask people like, what do you do to de-stress yourself? And then, as you just said, everybody has a toolbox and in there, there most of the time is like, I go running or I do some sports or I take a hot bath. And for some people, there's already meditation in there. And I just think that there is space for breath work as well, being it with a device, being it with a tool, being it going to a coach as well. The mission of our company really is just to make create awareness around the fact that our breath is one of the tools that we can use to work on this. And I actually, from a personal standpoint, it doesn't matter for me if it's with a coach through reading a book or having a moonbird, as long as you finally become more aware of the fact that you on your own can do and use your breath to, to calm your nervous system down, then my personal mission is succeeded. Yeah, no, I love that. Yeah, deep within you, you know, like deep inside of you, you know, the breath can be powerful. And I think what we're both trying to do in our own way is help people see that within them, they have something really powerful that can be quite helpful to their overall health, actually essential. So in the spirit of Kintsugi, the lacquer that puts the pieces of pottery together is called yurishi. It's the Japanese term for the lacquer. And so I believe a common thread or two common threads with everyone's yurishi, because it can be quite different for everyone, because we all have our own formula. Uh, one, obviously, foundationally is love, right? Like love helps connect and heal. And also our breath, right? Like the power of our breath. And we, you know, we just take it for granted until we don't have our health, you know, and then we're like, oh gosh, I wish I, I just want to get healthy right away. And we sometimes we forget about the things that the body already has within it that we can just tap into. I didn't ask you this the first time we chatted, but is there a meaning behind the name Moonbird? There is actually. So Moonbird is a real bird. He doesn't live anymore, but is a bird that some scientists followed for years and they tracked him and then measured the distance that he flew each year. And so it's a very tiny bird. It's a species of the red knot birds. And um, each year the bird flew or the moonbird flew from the Terra del Fuego in Argentina to the northern Arctic in Canada. And they measured that in his life he flew as much as the distance from the earth to the moon and back. And that for such a small bird, it was so special that they baptized him as the moon bird. And he actually has a Wikipedia page. There are some YouTube videos where you can see the moon bird in real life. But unfortunately, I think it was after 17 years or something, they couldn't find him anymore. But he's a signal. His name is now associated with longevity, with health, with well-being. And um, we learned about that through a story in the newspaper. I think it was, it was my mom or my dad. And um, yeah, we love the name. We love the meaning. My parents have something with flying. They were a pilot and an aerostat. Flying is super important in our family. And so it all came together and we just love the name. And we're going to say, we said, we're going to take this as the name for the company. Oh, that's so cool. That's a great story. And also such a tiny bird, like little things can do really wonderful, magical, huge things. Yeah. And in some perspective, it just all worked out because we, at that moment that we picked the name Moonbird, we were still like finalizing the product and so on. And I suddenly realized when people were using it while I was explaining it, I said to them, you can see it as a small bird that's breathing in your hand. And when the Moonbird, like the object 
breathes in and expands, you breathe in and you expand. And when it contracts, you breathe out. And so now the name really is a good name for the object as well. And it's funny because in Belgium, where we live, people really say, oh, you have a moonbird device. And um, it's sort of like the real bird has found a new life in so many new moonbirds out there. That's really cool. That's I love that. I love that. So starting anything can be difficult. What have you discovered about yourself through this whole process? I would say that I'm still growing so hard. I am discovering new parts of myself. And sometimes I discover, and that was maybe something that I never realized that I had so much, but I'm also discovering sometimes a bit of doubt. Like I'm growing in new directions and this is the first time that I'm going to do this. And sometimes it can be a bit scary almost, which is something that I'm, as the person that I am, I'm curious about that. And um, yeah, it's something that I am really learning of myself right now. Like we're building a team and I've never done that. We're hiring people that are more experienced than me. And I'm just trying to feel like, how does that go? How do I grow into these new roles that are expected from me? So that's something that I'm really like discovering as a company grows. I'm also growing in so many different ways. And I thought that once you're an entrepreneur, you just start the business and you're an entrepreneur. But no, you start a business because you often have an idea for a product. And then the company starts to grow and you need to take on so many different roles. And that's just something that I find really fascinating and that I'm learning of myself. That's really cool. It's so human. You know, we start and we're like, oh yeah, we got this great idea. And sort of like my story, like you had your story of like, yeah, a little pain and suffering, you know, the issue you had with your sleep and like, all right, I'm going to take this. I'm going to create an idea around it. We're going to start a company. And then it starts to grow and you're like, oh boy, <laughs> like you have some, you get a voice in your head. Yeah, go forward. Ah, oh, no, like, what am I doing? Like, they're going to find out I'm, I don't know what I'm talking about. You know, I have that dance too. Like there are moments where I feel like great confidence. So like, this is amazing. And then there are moments where I'm like, they're all going to figure this out that I'm using your flying analogy. I am uh, building the airplane as I fly it. So uh, I so appreciate yeah. <laughs> you talking about like the doubt that pops up in your head as well. Yeah, you know, I suddenly just also realized why some people are serial entrepreneurs, because I can see how much better you get at it when you do it a second time. Because the first time you have to learn everything, you have to do everything for the first time, really. And that's exactly what you mentioned about the airplane. That's a bit how it feels. But Michael, how was that for you when you started your company and the app? And tell me a bit more about that. Yeah, so it's interesting. So I had my mindfulness practice. I really came into it when I was in the hospital from my big cycling accident that you know about. So, the, you know, the doctors told my wife, we're really not sure how your husband survived because his injuries are so significant. And it was touch and go for the first, you know, few days. I was in the ICU and I don't remember anything about that. And I came out and I knew I was going to have such a long recovery ahead of me. It was, it really was overwhelming. And what I was trying to do is put on a good face, you know, put on my body armor. I'm like, I got this. And, but in the middle of the night when I was all alone in the hospital, I was like, I do not have this. This is like the worst thing ever. And there was a lot of crying, <laughs> yeah, like in the early, early weeks. And then I found mindfulness, you know, to make a long story short. And really more mindfulness-based stress reduction eventually, which was sort of created by John Kabat-Zinn here in the States, bringing an Eastern philosophy and the practice of Buddhism and meditation to the East and sort of almost made it a way of healing, right? Because he, he embedded it into the University of Massachusetts health system. But I really started off with like a simple box breathing pattern. That was my first session ever. But I knew something like I've always been an athlete. So I knew the importance of our breath. That's why I do some, sometimes chuckle when I run into um, maybe more macho guys, you know, like, and they're like, ah, I don't do any of that meditation stuff. And I'm like, you know, they're into sports. And I'm like, well, a foundation of good sports performance is your breath. You know, like when we take a time out, we're coming back to our breath and it slows the game down and all that jazz. So I go through the education with them to bring them into either breath work or mindfulness. So I did this practice, but you know, that was 2001 and we didn't have the internet as we know it. And it wasn't really, you know, mindfulness wasn't really talked about much back then. Today, we, you can't turn the corner 
and you can't get on social media without hearing something about living mindfully. But back then, no one was really talking about it, but I knew about it. And I knew it was a little, as we say in the States, I'm not sure if you say this in Belgium, but a little woo-woo. It was like a little out there. Wooly, yeah. Yeah, and we're like, no serious executive does this, but it felt good. I was like, in the hospital, it was like, it was helping me ease my overwhelm and ease my anxiety and my worry about who I was going to become because I had an ikigai, to your reference, I had an ikigai crisis. I was like, what happens when you almost die? What, what's your purpose? Like, what, what do I do now? And there was so much that was unknown. So I did this practice. Eventually, I got out of the hospital and then came into my corporate life again. And I kept on doing it because it, it was working. I was like, this is good. Like, I'm slowing the game down. All my other colleagues were reacting because of change and stuff. And I was like, all right, no, we're going to find a little bit of a calmer space. I still had my stressful moments. I wasn't perfect at it. So I just sort of kept it quiet. I called them pause, breathe, reflect moments, just a little pause, you know, connect with the breath. And the reflection piece for me was key. And I do see this as a difference between what I try to teach through my app than say other apps. That reflect piece is space to be thoughtful. Like, what do you want to say or do next? Um, What are you grateful for? What's your intention? And before you move forward from your practice, how do you want to move forward? That's a big thing. And so I kept it this private thing until I left my corporate life to become an entrepreneur. And then I started writing about pause, breathe, reflect breaks. So I was coming out a little bit, but it wasn't really until the pandemic because a lot of my coaching clients, because I was doing leadership coaching, people were like, yeah, when I talk to you, I just feel calmer. I feel like, oh, that was good. All right. I feel better. And I was like, oh, okay, good. And we would do like little pause, breathe, reflect meditation moments. And then the pandemic hit and I was like, well, if there's a moment that called for mindfulness, this is the moment. It was an invitation. So I started doing live practices on Clubhouse, another social app, you know, and then that grew. And then I was eventually said, okay, why am I doing it on someone else's platform? I'll create my own app. And because I was listening to people who said, like, your approach to mindfulness and meditation is slightly different than what we have out there. and when I hear your voice, and this was a hard thing for me, Stephanie, because like for all of us, you know, when your voice is recorded and it's played back to you, often it's like, oh, wow, is that how I sound? Like, I like really, who would want to listen to that, you know, that sound? (laughs) Because we don't generally like the sound of our own voice for a lot of scientific reasons. And, but I got over that and I realized, okay, we can put these shorter practices out there. So yeah, I've had my moments of learning how to do it and learning how to do the audio. And, you know, I have a recording box that I sit in and do it all. And, and what's really remarkable is that we created something really amazing from the spare bedroom of my house. So I've had really high heights and I've had moments just like you where I've had like incredible self-doubt. And at the end of the day, I know it matters to people and the community that we built matters. So that fuels me. That's part of my eeky guys that I want to show up for people and I want to help people through this difficult moment that we're all living in. That's so beautiful. And previous time when we talked, I shared with you as well that in my first mindfulness-based stress reduction course that I took, my takeaway was pause. And then later on, I discovered the breath or the breathe part, but I actually forgot about the reflect part. And so when we got to know each other and you mentioned that, that resonated so much with me because there's only little point in doing a pause breathe moment. Like how do I continue from here? How am I entering the next moment of my life? How do I want to do that mindfully? Like what decisions am I going to make? What person do I want to be? How do I want to behave? That's really the whole essence of why you take that small moment as well. And so I think, and probably for a lot of people in your community, that adding that reflect moment made it come full circle. And so that's, that's beautiful. Oh, thank you for that. And thanks for recognizing that. Yeah, for me, it can be journaling, it could just, you know, creating a list, but just that moment of thoughtfulness. And I, I did think that was missing in a lot of what's taught here in the States, where it's just more about, it almost becomes transactional. And what I love about what you all are doing with Moonbird is that you can have the device with you everywhere. Because I think what we're both trying to do is say, hey, listen, your breath is always with you. And 
this ability to connect with your breath and use it as a regulator and to live mindfully, that's ultimately the goal. It's not a something you do just in the morning, cross it off your to-do list, and then you're good, right? Because you know the thing is you can have a morning practice, but if you don't take the practice off your cushion or if you have a yoga practice, you don't take your practice off the mat and weave those principles into your day, then you're just doing a morning routine that's that's not bad. It's good, but it it's not to the point where you're mindfully living. And I think this moment that we share globally is a moment to live more mindfully so we can connect with each other better, even if we don't see the world the same way. Oh, I totally agree on that. And I always think that meditation is not, it's, or breath work, it's not an exercise, but for me, it's some sort of philosophy. It's a way that you behave and through which you approach the world. It's really more than just a practice for me. Um, and that for me was eye-opening as well. When I did my first meditation class, I think it was like, oh, I did an exercise. And it's only when I took my first mindfulness-based stress reduction course that I felt that I am changing as a person and how I behave outside these short practices as well. And the world around me is changing as well because I'm interacting with it in a different way. And so it finally made me aware of the fact that it's not about a thing that you do, like you go running and then that's it. No, you really, you live differently, you behave differently, you interact differently with people. And I am a firm believer that if everybody in their life, and that's why I think that breath work and, and meditation should be taught at schools to children when they're very young. I think that if we all have that awareness and would portray that philosophy, the world would be a better place and we would all behave much nicer towards each other and there would be less conflicts and so on. I completely, completely agree with that. I, th I think if we did take just a minute each day, just one minute and connect it with our breath in a very conscious, meaningful way. We would have more peace in the world. And, and there's certainly we can do practices like loving kindness and compassion practices and kindness practices. They can also help along with, you know, the really cool thing is you can do a, a moon bird with one of our loving kindness practices. And I just think it promotes more peacefulness because we're less reactive you know, we're like, let's just pump the brakes a little bit. So I know our natural tendency is going to be something happens and we're going to react. It's the groove. It's our habit. And what we're trying to do is say, hey, OK, slow it down a bit. Give it some space. How do you want to respond? Maybe you just want to let the moment breathe a little bit. You don't have to react. Or if there's some action that's called for, how do you want to respond? And how do you put a beautiful ripple in there? How do you show up with kindness? And that doesn't mean that we're not having emotions of that are heated, like anger and irritation and frustration. Like I still have those moments. I recognize those. And it's only energy, as we talked about earlier. And then how do I want to use that energy? Do I want to add fuel to that so I become even angrier? Or do I want to use that dissatisfaction, that anger, and do something better with it. And so I think, yeah, what you're talking about is like totally spot on. More equipped to deal with it and then make a conscious decision on how you deal with it. That's exactly what it is. And that's exactly something that a lot of people still can improve on, I'd say. And it's also very difficult, right? And as you just said, and I think that's super important to share with people as well, it's not because you're suddenly aware of these things that you're the poster child for this you still also make mistakes and you still find yourself being angrier than you hoped for or starting to do something or was starting to feel nervous or whatever. It's still super normal. You're still, we're still not Buddha himself. Yeah. And that's also not the object. It's just a matter of having just that little bit of awareness more that, yeah, that already helps and makes the world a better place. Yeah. One of my mentors when I was in the hospital shared with me, he's like, Michael, everything that happens to you in life is neutral until you label it. and what you just talked about was creating a little bit of space so you can be thoughtful about how you want to label the things that are happening in life. And yeah, you know, as we've talked about, I still get worried and anxious and I, I still get pissed off and angry. And, you know, you just, you want to scream. 
I still have those moments. I think we're all perfectly human as as human beings. And, you know, we're all sort of kintsugi. But all right, you notice that in your body, right? That when you're angry and you're like, okay, how do I want to be? You know, what do I want to do with the juju that's flowing through my body right now? And I love that, actually. That's a very good tip maybe to share to people who are listening as well as learn to label your emotions because first you feel something, you feel, and then you need to like, is this anger? Is this nervousness? Is this, is this something else? Is this love? Is this warmth? Is this luck? Learning to label these things that pop up that you feel is like a very important mental thing to do. And I know that my mindfulness teacher in the beginning always insisted on that when we close our eyes and we did like a meditation exercise, like what's coming up and then just label it as a thought, like do not label it anymore as a specific emotion or whatever. It's just label it as thoughts and make it more neutral now. So it's a whole play of like labeling and then making it more neutral and then letting go and taking it closer to you and then acting upon it and so on. But it's like, a yeah, it's it's a very powerful skill to master if you can do that correctly. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, at the start of our conversation, you did that when I asked you about, hey, how's your central nervous system? You're like, oh, good question. And you were like, you were positively excited, right? So that the energy you felt in your body, you could have labeled it as anxiousness or anxiety. You know, there's enough space there. You had enough space to say, hey, what do I want to call it? And I, like, how do I want to show up for this conversation? So yeah, I love what you just shared. All right. Now it seems like a good time to take a moment to pause, breathe, reflect. And when we return, Stephanie and I will continue our conversation about how to bring more well-being to humans all across the world. All right, let's take a break. Take a full breath in and a slow releasing breath out. And relax the body as you soak up our conversation. Ah, I hope that felt good. Okay. Now that we're a little bit more relaxed, can we be real? I think our morning routines, well, they've gotten a little out of control. You might not have time in the morning to meditate because you're busy doing other things like trying to get to work or getting the kids off to school. And this is where my app, Pause, Breathe, Reflect, comes in because I built it for busy people with a whole bunch of shorter practices. So if you don't have 10 minutes in the morning to meditate, cool beans. You're human after all. But I bet you have five times throughout the day when you have two minutes to practice and let go of stress and bring mindfulness to your everyday moments. So today, Download Pause, Breathe, Reflect for free and begin to stress less, sleep better, and join a community of like-hearted humans rippling something worth rippling into the world. All right, let's go back to our conversation and celebrate the Kintsugi within us all. So when you think about Moonbird going forward, I know there's a lot going on with it. There's a lot going on with both of our lives. So what do you envision Moonbird to be as you, I guess, fly forward to use the the flight analogy? Yeah, I love that. Well, my personal mission, and it's also the mission of the company, is that through Moonbird, we want to create awareness around the fact that people can use their breath as a tool. And um, within that bigger mission, we're developing products and ultimately potentially also services. That's a bit like open-ended right now, but in the beginning, products that help people to use their breath as a tool because it's not always that easy to do it. Even though there are these wonderful apps out there, some people who are not connected to their nervous system anymore where the mind-body connection is a bit lost, let's say for people who have been hyperventilating or suffering from hyperventilation or having a lot of panic attacks, they're just so disconnected from their body as well. And then it can be hard to just read a book or follow a course or something because it doesn't enter, I think. So then 
I believe that these physical tools where you literally don't have to think or follow or do anything anymore, you just literally hold on and you breathe with it can be very useful as well. So that's what we want to do like right now is make sure that people have these tools and are equipped to start practicing. And over time, we envision the company to grow in, I don't know in what direction, being it partnering with other apps like you have and, and forging collaborations and just all combining these people with a shared mission, but trying to reach as many people as possible as we can to create that awareness around the fact that we all have this very, very powerful tool, but we just never realize how to use it. I like the fact that you have this unknown quality to the vision. You know, with a lot of founders or a lot of entrepreneurs or just business leaders, there is this pressure to be so precise with like, this is what we want to be. Like, here's our target. Here's how many members we would have in our community or from a P&L perspective, like our revenue and our profitability, right? When you talk to investors, there's such pressure to have that precision, even though we're making forecasts and we're trying to predict the future, which is so hard. So I love the fact that you're like, what we know deep in our hearts is that we want to reach more people and what it really looks like is still unknown and we're going to allow it to unfold with a bit of grace. Then so we're going to show up with our principles that we've created here at Moonbird and we're going to see where this road goes with the overall desire of like trying to help as many people catch their breath, find their breath as desired. So I just, I love that you have that as a, that as a mission, which is really cool. I think more leaders, and I understand like here in the US, you know, for those that have investors or might have a place to play on the NASDAQ or Wall Street, there is that pressure to be like really exact that this is what we're going to do. But I think the reality is, is that we don't fully know because it's not necessarily all in our control. So we're going to give it some space. We're going to work hard. We're going to put out goodness and we're going to see where this road takes us, which is really, there's a lot of liberation and freedom to that. Yeah. And we have like a, a sharper two to three year vision, obviously in front of us, but that's more like the long-term, what's the long-term mission of the company? What's the raison d'être? What's the reason that you exist as a company? And what is that very big and is it ambitious? I don't know. It's just as many people as possible. If it's possible in some kind of way that I could have every person in the world realize this, then let's go for it. I'm just not really sure how feasible that will be. But if it's possible, then yeah, let's do it. And that's also why I say like we are developing products and that's our core business in the two to three year vision that we have in front of us. But I'm not excluding that at some point we will work with coaches that will have some kind of platform that will do something or collaborate with others having platforms to just be able to reach those people. Because for me, it doesn't really matter how, it's more a means to an end. Right now it's focused on physical products because I think that's also, a, it's new, it's innovative, it's something that hasn't been done before. But over time, it's whatever works to reach as many people as possible and to create that awareness. And I personally just hope that Moonbird as a name, could be associated with that as well. I think that's cool to see in Belgium, where we're from as well, that people in the beginning might say like, oh, what's that? Because it looks a bit like a vibrator. <laughs> it's an avocado-shaped device. And that people said like, oh, what is it? And now it's the opposite way. People see it and they say like, oh, you have a moonbird. You must be taking good care of yourself because you're investing in your mental health and you're, you know what breath work is and you're using that cool tool. So I hope that over time, the name Moonbird and the device as well becomes something that people like have a very positive connotation towards. Oh, I love that. I love that. I'll give a vote to the whole coaching element that you guys are thinking about. Because to your earlier point, I do think clearly there's a lot of meditation apps out there. And I think we just give someone an app and we're like, here you go, become a meditator without any type of support or coaching or guidance sort of like giving someone a fishing pole and say, go fish, and they don't know anything about fishing. And that's why like for what we do on my app, we put coaching around that. We put the guidance and teaching to help people along. Now, there's a question about scalability one day, right? So we'll get there when we get there. But I do feel like a lot of talk about mindfulness, a lot of different apps out there, but I don't know if everyone's truly 
practicing it because they don't have the right infrastructure and support to make it a way of living and to answer questions that come up when we start a new practice. I think we all need mentors, guides, teachers in our lives. So the fact that you all are thinking about a coaching element to it, to your device, which again, I agree, it's novel and it's like right there. And it's really cool that people are recognizing it now in Belgium. But that combination of human to human, especially in a world that's rapidly approaching more AI, like how do we have that human to human, hey, I see you connection along with our devices or guided meditation? To me, I it sounds like just much more of a holistic approach that's healthier. So I love where you guys are thinking about it. You're absolutely right. And without realizing at that moment, I think, so before I started Moomert, I was already meditating and I used uh, Headspace, for instance, which I absolutely love. I think it's a great app as well. It's been a while now that I use it, but I remember that at then I used it and it didn't click yet. It intrigued me, but it made me led to subscribing myself for a mindfulness-based stress reduction course. And it's only then when I completely submerged myself in that course that I really felt what meditation could do for me. And so I think it's exactly that that was missing for me at that point. So I, I love it that you guys do that and provide that broader context to help people really make the most benefit out of this and then get the full potential out of this because I think it's really about that like you get a course and then yeah you listen to it but do you really feel it are you living it are you understanding it do you need some extra focus or are there any things that you need to dive deeper on or learn more about and then you need those coaching sessions so yeah I love that yeah our live sessions really make make all this possible. It's it's again, part of the Urishi, it's the glue where people can come in because I do live practices throughout the week and we practice together. And there's usually some type of talk called a Dharma talk or teaching, but also just whoever wants to share whatever is happening in life, they can share with the group. And so what it does is it it demonstrates that we're all going through stuff and we can be there for one another. And so Unlike like a bicycle wheel with a hub and spoke, what our community can do is people can connect with each other. And now you have like, oh, wow, there's, you know, there's people from everywhere just being able to connect with each other and help us all sort of connect and heal and and move forward in that Kintsugi spirit. So uh, I have one more question for you, Stephanie, before we wrap up. Yeah, shoot. There's a show here in the States. It's not on the air anymore, but back in the day, it was called Inside the Actor's Studio. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of it. No. Okay. So it was a show that was broadcasted from New York City. And the host, James Lipton, would ask famous movie stars or actors, you know, Tom Hanks and Jennifer Lawrence and those folks, you know, about their craft. And in the audience were a bunch of acting students. They wanted to become famous actors on Broadway or in theater, uh, TV, and the movies. It was all about, tell us your secrets. And so at the end, James Lipton would ask rapid fire questions before there was such a thing as rapid fire questions. So he would ask this one question I always loved, and we always end the podcast on this one. So we're going to assume that God and heaven exist. So when life is over in this physical world for you, and you go up and you get to meet God, for the first time, what would you like them to say to you when you meet them for the first time? I would love it in some kind of way that I would have made a long lasting impact. So not only like an impact that changed my friends or my family, but something that ripples beyond maybe what I'm doing right now in my generation. But if you in some kind of way create something that lives beyond you, Like, I love that idea of people that are creative, if they create music or they create paintings, you might pass at some point, you will pass at some point, but the painting lives on forever. That has like, even if it's just a small painting, it has a long lasting impact because it can be there forever and people can admire it, how small it can be. And it can even just be in one household. But if in some kind of way, you, your spirit, or your touch to the world lives longer than your lifespan or the generation that comes next. And if that would be through Moonbird, if that could be it, that would be that would be amazing. Yeah. 
That would be amazing. That's a beautiful ripple. That's awesome. I so appreciate what you're doing and I'm so glad we're connected. Can I ask, what was your your question from God? So uh, you're the first one to ask me this, which is really cool. I would want them to say, boy, you put a beautiful ripple into the world. And in a similar way to what you just shared, just knowing that I took something that was tragic that happened to me and we were able to, another bird reference, sort of like a phoenix rising, turn it into something really amazing for other people. You know, again, also going back to Ikigai, like that purpose that's bigger than you. And that's what I hear and what you've shared today is the purpose is bigger than you and to help others with their well-being and their health and connect with their breath. Because I know this, that I always took my health for granted until I lost it. When I started to regain it, I never wanted to lose it again. And so taking that moment and then turning it into a powerful ripple, I hope God sees it, you know, because so many people told me at the time after the accident, they're like, God was looking out for you. And I was pretty angry at the time. I was like, I don't think God was looking out for me at the time of the impact. I think they were having a scone and a latte because if they were really looking out for me, they would have made the car, the truck avoid me. But what I realized is that a lot of this, you know, was all part of my journey and making things like this podcast and the app and other things into something that can change people's lives. Yeah, I hope I hope God recognizes that. I think if you can see it like that, Michael, what you are doing, then you have succeeded in life already. That's how you need to approach things because bad things will happen. But if you can then see how it has positively impacted you and not only in this case you, but through all the ripples that you have created, then I think you have succeeded in life as well. So God for sure is seeing that. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. That was awesome. So and thanks for being part of uh, our Kintsugi community and another, uh, as I like to say, like-hearted member of it who is open to different mindedness. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to uh, see where Moonbird flies next. And one day when I'm over in Europe, maybe we'll meet in real life. Yes, I go to a concert together. I would love that. Yes, absolutely. That sounds like a perfect plan. So well, enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, I hope your central nervous system treats you well for the rest of it. Thank you. Don't you just love Stephanie and her energy? I loved having that conversation with her. And I hope you enjoyed it as well. And as we do with podcasts, in the show notes, I'll include all the different ways you can connect with Stephanie and Moonbird. And if there's something that really resonated with you from our conversation, I would love to hear it. So reach out in any way that you wish. I know your time is your most precious resource. So I'm so grateful that you decided to carve out some time to join us here on the Kintsugi Podcast. And if you haven't yet, please leave a kind review. It's one way for people to know about Kintsugi and spread our good ripple so we can make the world a better place to reconnect and to heal in our Kintsugi spirit and celebrate our golden symbols of strength. And I hope you'll share this particular conversation, the one I just had with Stephanie, with your friends and colleagues, even your frenemies. I imagine they would really appreciate it. And it's one way to show that you're thinking about someone else is by sharing. And it's the best way to overcome the algorithm that seems to dictate our lives. So again, thank you for being here. I appreciate you. And if you'd like to receive my weekly newsletter that comes out every Sunday, please go to michaelobrienshift.com and sign up for the ripple effect. And we'll deliver it easy peasy, lemon squeezy, into your inbox. And until next week, celebrate your golden symbols of strength. Celebrate the kintsugi that's within you. And if you face a challenging moment, slow it down, come back to your breath, and know that you've got this. And here, we've got you. And together, we'll put a beautiful ripple 
into the world. Thanks again for being here. I love you for listening.